artists. We are at the Oklahoma uh, Contemporary Arts Center. It's a wonderful place in, the, uh, in uh, Oklahoma City. And it, this is the home of the Oklahoma Latino Cultural Center, which just started this year in February. And the mural behind us is uh, really interesting. It's done by Narciso Arguez. He is the executive director of the Oklahoma Latino Cultural Center. And this is a painting that depicts a really important image from the Day of the Dead and an important tradition in the Americas. Really nobody knows how old the Day of the Dead is in the Americas. It's always been there. And there's so many really important cultural strands that come through the Day of the Dead. It's like a treasure trove of, of, of very important cultural indicators if you're trying to study the Americas, having to do with conceptions of death, the human body, uh, citizenship in the Americas. Uh, there are just so many issues that come up in relation to images like this. Uh, mestizos are mixed race people in the broadest sense in the Americas. Um, starts out in the Spanish colonial period being a mestizo is a Spaniard and indigenous person, but not really represents just mixed race people in the Americas. So it's casting the, the broadest net. And uh, I'm a Latino, uh, I think a fairly assimilated Latino. I'm a professional. I feel wonderful about the world that I'm in and, and largely appreciate it. There are millions and millions of Latinos who are from the Americas and never feel that they are welcome from the, uh, at the place that they are actually from. So I wanted to make the title of this book as unambiguous as possible. Mestizos, come home. You belong here. This is your home. Uh, you've, all, you've been here since before European people. and. Um, and I just didn't want the, a title that could be interpreted any other way. My book, my book has an argument. And the argument is that Latinos need to stop apologizing for being in the place they're actually from. And they have the deepest roots of, uh, as par partial indigenous people, the deepest roots of anybody in uh, the Americas. And it, it's a, also a book for non-Latinos. I want, I want non-Latinos to understand what Mexican Americans are trying to achieve and what they deal with every day. And I want them to have a little more sympathy and stop making Latinos the enemy. As I kind of sectioned out these six areas uh, where the Latino community has had a pretty strong impact on mainstream community uh, since the 1960s, having to do with uh, identity, uh, attitudes towards land, attitudes towards the human body, uh, popular culture, um, the emergence of a, of a cultural voice in the um, early 70s that represented the Latino community and then the rise of Chicano studies and, and Chicano literature, um, I, I, I made some discoveries that kind of shocked me a little bit. There was so much critical information on so many things that was not entering, entering the national conversation, particularly about race and particularly about the history of the Americas. And it kind of alarmed me a little bit because I saw myself as maybe digging out things America needed to know more about. And the evidence very often was there was a lot of low-hanging fruit that nobody cared to pick. A question of identity. Uh, mestizo people, uh, which includes um, uh, Mexican Americans, uh, you know, the broad Latino category in general, uh, most people in the Americas, the, you know, the many countries of Latin America are mestizo people. They, are mixed race people, there's a history to their being mixed. And it has to do with uh, the Spanish colonial period and the Spanish coming to this the new world in the 16th century. And uh, the short story here is that, that the Spanish set in motion some generation of a lot of new identities having to do with indigenous people and the African people and the Chinese people and others they brought uh, into the Americas. And as a colonial power, they felt that they were run, losing control, really, of what they had set in motion. They didn't know who these people were and these new communities that were developing. It was all happening so, so quickly. So they created a system of racial classification where there are 16 categories. And these categories uh, start with, uh, kind of imagine, four rows of four, because it's often depicted in painting. And the first. Uh, slot is occupied by a Blanco, a white Spaniard. And as you move to the right in, in each case, uh, people get more racially mixed. And theoretically, by the time you get to the 16th category, 
you've described everybody in the Americas. This is really r racist stuff. You know, the Spanish were setting themselves up as the, the norm, the white people, and then they created the notion of a brown body. And a brown body was a distant reflection of their own body and a, sort of a bad copy. And once it got further and further mixed, particularly with Africans, it became, as the Spanish uh, put it, polluted, and there was no coming back. And it is so pervasive that if you are a person living in the Americas now and you look down at your own skin and your arm or your leg, whatever, you are looking through the lens that the Spanish created. And so one of the things that my book tries to do is say, folks, wake up. You know, something so powerful as racism always has a history to it. And if you're going to pull it by the roots, you have got to understand the history. In terms of land, I can say this maybe a little more uh, quickly. Um, there's a long tradition in the Americas of land being sacred. Uh, uh, the, the, in Spanish law and in Mexican law, there was this concept that is uh, almost gone now. We have something kind of similar to it called um, ejidos, uh, E-J-I-D-O-S, ejidos. And ejidos were community lands, and they can't be sold. It really has to do with what we call the commonwealth. And, um, and uh, so lands that are ejidos are traditional lands owned by the people. Uh, there are cultural, traditional associations with that land. Your, your grandparents are probably built, uh, buried in that land. You will maybe be buried in that land one day. In modern America, land is a commodity. And it's sold on the open market to the highest bidder. Now, there are people in have nothing to do with Latino culture, uh, uh, professional geographers in the academy, in the universities in the United States, that have worried about this for a long time. Can a culture survive where there is almost no cultural association or traditional associations with land? This has never happened before. Where land is a commodity sold to the highest bidder and it's like a piece of plastic and it's going to be shaped by whatever the, the next need for it is and it doesn't convey tradition, doesn't have anything to do with culture, doesn't have anything to do with values um, uh, any longer. And not just in the United States, but people all over the earth who are seriously worried about the sustainability of that. So uh, Mexican Americans have really done a lot to foreground this issue of an indigenous relationship to land, more of an ecological, environmental ap approach to land, although it's not current, like it's not, not a current environmental issue. It's been there for uh, thousands of years. So there's an awful lot to say about uh, conflicting ideas of land, and the Mexican-American community has done a lot to clarify this. Uh, the body, and it, w the short of it is, in modern contemporary America, we think of the body as being disposable. And, and, and to just come on right down to the present, when in Flint, Michigan, they were uh, 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 willing to have a whole community drink bad water for 10 years. The, the underlying assumption was these bodies are disposable. It's okay to do that. In this traditional uh, uh, view of the world, the body is never disposable. It is sacred. And so there's an there's a, uh, incredible conflict here. And this has not been dealt with enough. There are indigenous, Latino, Mexican-American traditions about the way the body is conceived, where the body is a world unto itself. It's the world you live in. The, the second three areas are more indices of changes than the first. For example, popular culture. Uh, you can, if we look at Day of the Dead practices, Cinco de Mayo practices, what we, or uh, lowrider car culture, I talk about that in my book, what we're looking at is a, a kind of staged encounter of Mexican-American culture and the balance for a Mexican-American of how much Mexican culture, how much American culture gets um, kind of mixed into your life is always changing. It's a dynamic thing. So popular culture is where that's played out. If you want to sort of see where Mexican-Americans are in terms of drawing on tradition versus contemporary commercial realities living in America, Popular culture reveals that, that, because that's where it's played out on kind of a minute-by-minute uh, a minute basis. Um, I also talk about voice. There's a great 
um, Mexican-American writer who went to the university that I teach at, Tomas Rivera, and he, he uh, got a PhD at the University of Oklahoma, and he was a writer from Texas. His breakthrough novel, Inocelo Trago La Tierra, and the Earth Did Not Devour Him, really signaled to the country that Mexican-American culture had arrived at the point where it deserved a national audience, and his book had a national audience. And right after that, a year later, Rudolfo Anaya's Bless Me Ultima, and then over the next 10 years, a whole lot of Mexican-American writers appeared that uh, really helped to define the culture and brought it to the United States. Once those writers were writing, the country could pay attention to Mexican-American um, culture because they could go in a local Barnes and Noble and buy those books. They didn't have to go in a, to a barrio. There wasn't a sense they were culture crossing. There was a sense that they were maybe peering into an exotic culture a little bit. But it did, it, and that's not a good thing, you know, to exoticize another culture. But it was a good thing that a kind of window to Mexican American culture uh, opened up. A lot of those writers, getting my last category, the emergence of Chicano literature, <coughs> Chicano culture, a lot of those writers became professors in American universities. So there were suddenly these, Rodolfo Anaya, uh, my good friend, uh, uh, was one of those. So he was a world famous writer, but he taught in the English department at the University of New Mexico. So this was a really big thing. So the emergence of Chicano literature and then the writers like that that were teaching uh, Chicano studies, that really brought Mexican American Latino culture to the nation in a whole different way because it was being institutionalized. Now publishers like Werner Books and Scribner's and uh, uh, Farrar Strauss Giro, et cetera, were presenting and framing this culture. So there was a kind of crossing of a threshold that hadn't happened before. You know, my sense is that these six areas, if somebody reads the book and really gets through all six, they're gonna have a sense, a kind of, um, sort of like a vivisection, sort of cutting the culture right through the middle, and they can look at the impact that that Mexican-American Latino culture has been having since the, since the 60s. There are millions of Americans still who've never known a black person. They don't know a, a Mexican-American. Uh, maybe you've only met a Latino. And, and they're well-intentioned, but you can only care what you know about. And if you don't know anything about the black community or the Mexican-American community, and you are hearing things in the media that are sometimes sensational, sensational, very often sensational, you build your responses on that. And so it is a real problem that the country is still segmented. And I don't know how to fix this. And I, again, I think it's a lot of folks that are well-meaning just haven't met anybody unlike themselves uh, enough to actually make a difference. And a, uh, a similar kind of problem uh, is that the Mexican-American community, because they were uh, been marginalized, they don't see themselves reflected in the culture, often haven't known enough about themselves. And here's a really important fact, there is some information so important that it changes the people who know it. And your history, your own culture, your own origins, that is information so important that when you know it, you are different. And so uh, that, that's where Chicano studies, Chicano literature, and, and I hope in a small way my book is going to bring that culture out in the open more uh, because the, it's not my book that will create the changes. It's the knowledge that maybe it will help to unlock. Information is so important that it changes the people who know it.